I hope that y'all are well today and enjoying another wonderful week. I'm here today to present the second video for this session. In this video, I will summarize my thoughts on y'all's comments to this past week's discussion board postings. Also, I will try to answer any questions that have arisen about our next class meeting, in particular the debate. Then I will turn our attention to the outlines that are due on Friday. Finally, I will introduce the next set of chapter readings and set the stage for the next discussion questions. So let's get going. Overall, I am pleased with the comments of those who have participated in the discussion questions. I can tell that y'all have read the text, absorbed the content, and synthesized the information. Your postings are thoughtful and on target. Most of you commented that there isn't a perfect programming option because each of your settings has its own unique contextual variables. Given that information, though, each of you were able to put forth some original ideas. In summary, it seems that all of y'all are in agreement that all of y'all are in agreement that in some form or another, what we call a continuous progress curriculum model is appropriate. Now, let's talk about this. A curriculum, a, a continuous progress curriculum model has three components. The first are clearly defined learning goals and objectives that build upon one another in both complexity of task and content. The second is programming flexibility that allows students to move on to more complex goals and objectives after completing less sophisticated ones. Third, that students learn to take ownership over their learning in a way that teaches them to become lifelong autonomous learners. Now, if you go back and reread the chapters that focused on programming, I think you will see on a macro level, in a very generalization, a very general sense, that all of those models have these three in uh, elements. So whether it's called a school-wide enrichment model, acceleration, differentiation, uh, school within a school, the Purdue three-stage enrichment model, maybe the autonomous learner model, or even the parallel curriculum model, the ultimate goal is to promote students who can independently identify problems and offer novel solutions. Now, these, all of those different models sort of fall under this large umbrella of a continuous progress curriculum model. So I was thrilled that y'all picked up on this thread. In addition, I must say, and let me pick her out here, that Lori Skelton gave me that Lori Skelton gave me something to think about. She wrote, "It's a false conclusion to assume that seniority, yeah, that seniority equates intellectual social peerage. That's a great point because academic achievements might be dynamic variables, but IQ is constant. So Lori, I want to thank you for giving me that to think about." As I read through the debating discussion boards for groups, I noticed that groups one and four have been very active. They have shared information and seem to be getting ready for our Friday meeting. Now, that's not to say that the other groups aren't or that that's not to say that the other groups are being neglectful. I just wanted to comment on uh, groups one and four. Oh man. Man, 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 that's all. Hello. I hope that you are well today and enjoying another wonderful week. I'm here today to present the second video for this session. In this video, I will summarize my thoughts on y'all's comments to this past week's discussion board posting. Also, I will try to answer any questions that have arisen about our next class meeting, in particular our debate. Then I will turn our attention to the outlines that are due on Friday. Finally, I will introduce the next set of chapter readings and set the stage for the next discussion question. Overall, I have been pleased with the comments of those who have participated in the discussion questions. I can tell that y'all have read the text, absorbed the content, and synthesized the information. Your postings are thoughtful and on target. Most of y'all commented that there isn't a perfect programming option because each setting has its own unique contextual variables. Given that information, though, each of you were able to put forth some personal ideas about your ideal gifted program. While each of your postings had original ideas, in summary, it seems that you are all in agreement that some form of gifted or some form of perfect gifted programming falls under what we all call a continuous progress curriculum model. Now, a continuous progress curriculum model has three components. The first are clearly defined learning goals and objectives that build upon one another in both complexity of task and content. The second is programming flexibility that allows students to move on to more complex goals and objectives after completing less sophisticated ones. 
Third, the students third that students learn to take ownership over their learning in a way that teaches them to become lifelong autonomous learners. Now, if you go back and reread the chapters and that focus on programming, I think you will see on a micro level, in a very general sense, that each of these models that we read about all have these three elements. So whether you call it the school-wide enrichment model or acceleration or differentiation or the school uh, within a school, the Purdue three-stage enrichment model, the autonomous learner model, or even the parallel curriculum model, the ultimate goal of all these approaches is to promote students who can independently identify problems and offer novel solutions. Now, I was thrilled that y'all picked up on this thread. It really made me uh, feel good and, and let me know that you're reading critically and absorbing the information in ways that allow you to be able to explain to others what it is that gifted education needs to accomplish when it's devising gifted programming. What are its goals and objectives? Now, before we move on to the next section, I want to thank Lori Skelton for giving me something to think about in her discussion board posting. She wrote, it's a false conclusion to assume that seniority equates intellectual social peerage. That's a great point, Lori. In fact, what we have to remember is that maybe academic achievement levels are, are dynamic variables, meaning that they can change from uh, one day to the next, one year to the next. IQ, however, is constant, so a second grader with an IQ of 140, as Lori pointed out, would have that same IQ level as a fifth grader. So when we're talking about acceleration, maybe we're not always putting students with their intellectual peers uh, if we remove them from their chronological age peers. Talking about asynchronous development that she mentioned, so I thought that was really good. Thank you, Lori, for uh, bringing that up. As I read through the debating discussion boards uh, for the groups, I noticed that groups one and four have been active. They shared information and seem to be getting ready for our Friday meeting. Now, this is not to say that the other groups are being neglectful. I, I just wanted to commend groups one and four. The only common question that I've noticed from these groups is about the presentation of the information. Again, you do not have to come to class with a presentation already put together. Just, just make sure that you have read your topic and are prepared to defend your point that either gifted females are more at risk for underachievement or your point that gifted males are more at risk for underachievement. Now, I'm really excited about having an in-class debate. These are my tentative plans for the activity. Uh, first, we're going to get together and we're going to set some ground rules, and we'll do this as a class. Next, uh, I'll allow time for each group to organize their thoughts and prepare for the debate. Then we will have our debate and vote on the winners. And then finally we'll debrief and move forward from there. So that should kind of give you an idea of what Friday evening is going to look like. Now let's talk about your paper outlines. A few of you have sent me their have sent me your information to read before next Friday. This is great or before this Friday. This is great. But do not think it is mandatory. Remember, the outline is not graded. Rather, it simply helps me to see the direction you're headed, and it allows me to help you focus your writing. After you su submit your information on Friday, uh, September 23rd, I will take the week to read through your information, provide comments, and post it back to eLearning. Now, I typically wait until I've read all the com that uh, I've read and commented on all outlines bef before posting my comments. As such, you will have them returned to you before we meet face to face on September 30th. Now, my last discussion point for this video session centers on chapters 14, 16, and 17. In general, these chapters highlight the social emotional issues faced by gifted students. In reading these chapters, you should gain some, gain some general background knowledge about the unique characteristics of these students. Your discussion question this week will ask you to put together an advocacy plan to present, parents about the so to, present to parents about the social emotional needs of gifted students. I do not want you to think that you need to compile pages and pages of ideas. Rather, I want you to focus on three main points that you think parents need to know and two ideas that you do not think that most parents know about. So, I uh, look forward and, uh, to that information being posted on the discussion board. Again, I want to thank all of y'all for your efforts thus far. I've appreciated your comments and questions and dedication to this course. As we move forward, do not hesitate to contact me and continue to ask questions as they arise. Otherwise, y'all have a great afternoon and I look forward to talking to you later.